All right, let's go in our Bibles this morning, if you would, to the book of Acts. We pick up our study here in Acts chapter 18, where we left off just a couple of weeks ago. Acts chapter 18. And if you'd direct your attention this morning to verse number 18, we'll read down through the rest of the chapter. Acts chapter 18, verse number 18 through 28. And I'd like to speak to you for the next few moments about a servant of the Lord. His name is Apollos, and he's talked about here in this passage. There's other places in the scripture which speak about him, and we want to consider a little bit about his testimony and some things that we can learn from his life this morning. Verse number 18 of Acts 18, the scripture says, And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria... And with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Centria, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and Being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come helped them much which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Now you'll notice in the first paragraph of our text, verses 18 through 23, that the travels of the Apostle Paul are detailed. He having taken a vow, most likely a Nazarite vow from the wording of the text, And a Nazarite vow could be taken by a Jewish man for any number of reasons. It could be taken for as short as seven days or as long as an entire lifetime. In this case, Paul took a vow for a period of time. And it's indicative that it was a Nazarite vow because the scripture says that when he concluded this vow, he shaved or he had shorn his head. And what would often happen when Jewish men were far off from the temple, they would cut their hair at the end of that vow. Of course, part of the vow was to let their hair grow long, and that was a distinctiveness of the vow that they had taken. They were to shave their hair, and then eventually when they had the opportunity to travel, to bring that to the temple in Jerusalem as an indication of the vow that they had taken. It seems that Paul did that. And then in his travels, he came to the great city of Ephesus. Now, we know that Ephesus is going to figure large in the New Testament history. And in in fact, we're going to learn a lot about the ministry in Ephesus beginning in Acts chapter 19 and its impact upon the known world at that time. But Paul, for this time, was just there for a short period. And at this time, he had a couple traveling with him, Priscilla and Aquila, who you may recall he had met in the city of Corinth. They were now traveling with him and laboring with him. They came to the city of Ephesus, and Paul immediately entered into the synagogue. He began to preach about Jesus Christ to the Jews, and they wanted him to stay longer, but he felt pressed in the spirit to go to the feast, most likely the feast of Passover in the city of Jerusalem. And so he told them that he would return, and he did go to the feast in the city of Jerusalem. And then from there, he made his way up to the city of Antioch, to the church that was there. 
and then from Antioch up into the region of Asia Minor. And he began going to the churches. And you'll notice in verse 23, his purpose in doing this was to strengthen all the disciples. So he was coming back to places where churches had been founded through his earlier ministry. And he was teaching and preaching and instructing and strengthening those churches because already apostasy had begun to creep into these early churches and already these things needed to be confronted. Now, we leave Paul there knowing that from that time in Asia Minor, he's going to come to the city of Ephesus. The city of Ephesus is over on the west coast of Asia Minor and he will make his way back there eventually to spend two years ministering in that place, preaching the gospel, discipling, training men, and seeing folks go forth with the gospel into especially the region of Asia Minor, planting churches. And then we come to verse 24, and this is a parenthesis in the ministry of Paul. So Paul is in Asia. He's not yet returned to the region of, uh, to the city of Ephesus, and we get a little window into the life of a man whose name was Apollos. Now, Paul would later speak about Apollos in uh, very respectful terms. Apollos was a man who was blessed by God, and eventually he would have a powerful ministry, an impactful ministry uh, that would that would have an effect in that part of the world, and God would use him greatly. But verses 24 through 28 introduce us to this man kind of at the beginning of his journey, if you will. And there's several things about Apollos that we learn in this passage, which I think are helpful to us as we seek to serve the Lord in this coming year, some lessons that we can learn. The first thing that I want to say to you that we see in the life of Apollos is that we should all use our natural talents in the service of the Lord. We have a tendency to take the gifts that are given to us by God and use them selfishly. And, And that could be something so simple as our physical strength, our ability to breathe, our health. And we can take that for granted as if it's just for us and we can end up using it for our own purposes. Or perhaps you've been gifted in some way, naturally, in some different area, and certainly all of us are gifted in one area or another. We have natural talents that we can use, and those natural talents should be used in the service of the Lord. You'll notice about Apollos that he was a unique unique man. He was born in the city of Alexandria, verse 24 tells us. And Alexandria was a city on the northern part of the continent of Africa where there was a concentration of Jewish people who had settled there during the diaspora, the scattering that took place during the captivities. And there in that particular region, the city of Alexandria was really well known as a seat of learning. It was a lot like Athens in the sense that it was a place of philosophy. It was a place of religion. And in particular, the city of of, uh, Alexandria was known because there was a Jewish rabbi, a teacher there, who had taken some of the philosophies of the Greek philosophers and had wed them with Old Testament doctrine and had put them together and come up with his own unique brand of Judaism. And that's a a thing in and of itself. We don't know that Apollos was a part of that movement. The text doesn't indicate that he was. We only know that he was born in Alexandria. And it seems from both the place that he was born and from his testimony as spelled out in this scripture, that Apollos was a very educated man. He was a man who had the ability to take the things that he could learn or that he had learned, and not only was he brilliant, but he was eloquent. He was able to take the things that he knew and communicate them powerfully to other people. And it says as much in verse 24, he was an eloquent man. 
Now, not everyone who is educated and intelligent is eloquent. It's a special blend of abilities to be able to take things that are hard to attain to intellectually and be able to explain them plainly so that others can hear and powerfully so that others are moved to want to take action in those areas. And Apollos was this kind of a man. We would say, for instance, about the the Apostle Paul, that he was very educated and very intelligent, but he said about himself that he had weakness of speech. And so while there may have been times when Paul could be incredibly eloquent, that was not necessarily one of his natural talents. And yet he still was someone who was used greatly by God. Now, Apollos was somebody, someone who was both educated and eloquent. And you'll notice in verse 24, one more thing about him was that he was mighty in the scriptures. No doubt, Apollos had been raised in a home where he was exposed to the Old Testament scriptures very early in his life. He knew the Old Testament scriptures like few others. It is likely that he had sat under the feet of of esteemed rabbis who taught the Old Testament, and he himself had attained a great level of understanding and, and skill in handling the scriptures such that he could take the word of God and he could apply it powerfully to other people's lives. He had studied diligently and he knew the Old Testament scriptures so well that he is described by the Holy Spirit as mighty in the scriptures. This is certainly a natural talent. We also know about him a, a gift that was given to him that we see in verse 24. He came to Ephesus. Now, it's not a short journey from Alexandria to Ephesus. And a journey like this in the ancient world would have cost a pretty penny. And so it seems evident that Apollos was a man who was a man of means, that he had some financial wherewithal to be able to travel from one place to another and to engage in seeing some parts of the world. And so he came from Alexandria and he came here to Ephesus and understand that all of these things that he had going for him were used in a very special way. Because in verse 26 it says, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. This sounds an awful lot like the Apostle Paul with some notable differences. But this man was passionate for the service of the Lord and he wanted to take the gifts that God had given him and use those gifts in the service of the Lord. I want to point out to you that every one of us has been given some gifts We've been given some abilities. We've been given some blessings. And those blessings are not intended for us to take simply for ourselves. But they are intended for us to give those back to the Lord and to ask Him to use those talents in His service. This is exactly what Apollos did. He wanted to take all of the things that God had given to him and used them to boldly speak about the things that he had learned from the Old Testament scriptures. Today, if you have some natural talents, or some talents that you have developed by hard work, you know, there are talents that are natural, and ones that are developed through hard work. But whatever the case, use your talents for the Lord. Make sure you give them to Him, and don't just use those for yourself. A second thing that we find about Apollos that should be true of every servant of the Lord, though, is found here in verse number 25, when it says this man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. The second truth I want you to come away with this morning is that every one of us who are servants of the Lord ought to be passionate in our service for the Lord. If there's something that your hand finds that is worth doing, then do it with all your heart. Do it as unto the Lord and not unto men. 
Here this man, Apollos, is described for us as being fervent in the spirit. This means that he had a fire that was burning in his heart. He had something, some truth that he wanted to communicate, and he was passionate about that truth. Martin Lloyd-Jones has famously said that preaching is logic on fire. And you know that ought to be the case, whether it's preaching in the pulpit or preaching one-on-one to other people who need to hear the gospel, we ought to be passionate about the things that we believe. We ought to be passionate about the service of the Lord. Enough of this blasé, vanilla-flavored kind of Christianity that just gets along to get through and finally gets past and says, okay, that's enough for me. I'm, I'm fine with just being an average Christian. No, let's be passionate about the things of God. If God's done something for you, then be fervent in your spirit. Be fervent about the message that God has given you to share. Not only was he fervent in his spirit, but he was bold in his speaking. Because this man had a fervency in his spirit, he taught diligently and he spoke boldly. The things that he was speaking about evidently were a little different than what the people in the synagogue were used to hearing. But that didn't stop Apollos from being bold to share the truth. The truth of the gospel The truth of God's word is unpopular in this modern day in which we're living. But may it be said of us that we have enough passion about what we believe, that we can be bold in our preaching, that we can share boldly the truth of God. We should be passionate. Whatever you do in your service for the Lord, do it with some passion. But you know, as I was thinking about this, It's interesting that these things are true about Apollos, that he was using his natural talents and he was passionate in his service for the Lord, but he didn't know some things. There were some things that he was lacking in. And Apollos didn't let that stop him. Now you could say, well, that's probably just exuberance. It's probably just pride. It's probably just overconfidence. And I... As I have studied the life of Apollos, I don't believe that is the case. I believe that Apollos was taking what he knew and he was utilizing it in the service of the Lord, which ought to be said about every single one of us. See, sometimes we get to the place where we say, well, if I just knew a little bit more, then I would serve the Lord. But my question to you is, do you know enough to get saved? If you're, if you're saved, then you must know enough to get saved. So you at least have a starting place to share something. You may not know a lot, but you could share something with other people. And you ought to be passionate about that which God has given you. And then, of course, you ought to study so that you could learn more and be more effective in the service of the Lord. So Apollos, he used his natural talents. We ought to use our natural talents. He was passionate. We ought to be passionate. But the third thing, and boy, this is so startling about Apollos, especially a man as accomplished as him, and it ought to be true of us. We all should be teachable in our service for the Lord. Here is Apollos, and he's preaching fervently. He's, I mean, he's getting with it. The the old timers would say he's hoeing the corn. He's, uh, he's getting out there and he's planting some seed. He's, he's preaching about the truth and he's excited about it. And Apollos is preaching and Aquila and Priscilla are there in the congregation. And they saw something in this young man. They saw some potential in him. They saw that he knew some things. In fact, the Bible tells us that he had been instructed in the way of the Lord. Now, Bible commentators disagree on exactly the extent of this instruction and what this meant. But my personal opinion is that Apollos had received enough instruction to be born again, to experience regeneration, which is where the passion, that's where the fire came from about what he was sharing. But it does also say that he knew only the baptism of John. So, again, without very many details. The details are very scant. And we don't know exactly what the passage is pointing out, but it would seem 
that perhaps Apollos had sat at some point under the preaching of John the Baptist, which was gospel preaching. Jesus himself said that the kingdom of God began with the preaching of John the Baptist, and after that, every man presseth into it. So John the Baptist was the first New Testament preacher. He was preaching the gospel. He was preaching repentance. And it seems that Apollos sat under his preaching and that he had heard that preaching and had been impacted by it and likely had been baptized by John the Baptist. But then it seems that he had departed, perhaps to go back to Alexandria and had not been exposed to the ministry of Jesus Christ who came shortly after John the Baptist. Because it's clear from the passage that Apollos doesn't know some things. And it seems that some of the things he doesn't know are about things like Jesus' disciples were also baptizing. And their baptism had now superseded the baptism of John the Baptist because John had gone off the scene. So we know that he had been instructed. Somewhere he had learned some truth and he had made some changes and his life had been transformed, but there were some things that he was missing. When Aquila and Priscilla had heard him, verse 26, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly or more fully. So he had some good things, but there were some things that he was lacking. Now, this would have been partly owing to the time period in which Apollos would have been saved and was ministering. Bear in mind, the New Testament had not yet been completed. At this point, very few of the New Testament books had even been written and circulated. Apollos would not have been exposed to those things. There's a possibility that he had heard some things about the ministry of Jesus and perhaps about his death and burial and resurrection, but we don't know for sure what Apollos knew. We do know this, that as he was preaching, Aquila and Priscilla discerned that there was some lack, and they said, we want to help this young man out because he has great potential to be used of the Lord. Now, understand that this is a sensitive thing. Approaching someone who's obviously learned and eloquent and mighty in the scriptures and indicating to them that there are some things that they're missing is likely to encounter some resistance. It's likely that you might find that that person is not necessarily going to be open to what is being said and to some degree, rightfully so. So, for instance... If someone approaches me after the service with some nugget of false doctrine that I've not yet discovered, then we'll have to have a discussion about what the Bible says. But see, the difference is here, Apollos was missing some aspects of sound doctrine. And when he listened to Aquila and Priscilla expound those things, he saw for himself that these were things that were scriptural and things that he had not yet understood. And what I want you to understand is, this man Apollos was humble enough and teachable enough that he could learn. You know, it is a mark of humility to realize that you have not arrived. None of us has arrived. None of us has everything figured out. None of us has every aspect of doctrine or practice figured out. And so we must be careful to carefully try. We we need to try the different doctrines that we might hear, but we need to be teachable in aspects of the Scripture. We don't know what it was that he needed instruction in, but what I love about Apollos is he did not feel himself to have arrived at the final destination And when he heard some things that he had never heard before, when he learned from others, and you might say, who were these people who were instructing him? 
ordinary people in the congregation of the synagogue. It doesn't seem that Aquila was a man with letters behind his name. It doesn't seem that that he was someone who would have been invited to necessarily speak in the synagogue like, say, the Apostle Paul, or in this case, Apollos. Aquila and Priscilla are, if you will, blue-collar kind of people. They, They work a job. They make tents. They're they're average individuals, but they are mighty in the scriptures. And and Apollos, when he began speaking to them, understood, here's some people who know some things, some things that I am not aware of, and he began to see some pieces come together in his understanding about the Messiah. Now, it's important that Aquila and Priscilla expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. In other words, they used exposition, presumably exposition of the scriptures. They set forward these truths logically and scripturally and in an understandable order. And they presented them to Apollos. And Apollos saw, wow, this is the missing piece. This is what I've wanted to know. By the way, it's likely that he sensed there was something missing that he sensed there was something more that he needed to know, an incompleteness. But he was fervent in what he did know. There was some maturing in truth that needed to happen. And here's what I love about this. When you're teachable, God will bring the right people along to teach you. It's a delight to me when I run into somebody who has learned some things and has grown in some ways but has maybe a little more learning to do. They have a little bit farther to go in their journey, but they're teachable. They want to hear. They want to know the truth. And this is a wonderful thing that all of us should seek to develop. None of us should get to the place where we say, I've already heard all those messages. I've heard so many messages on that passage of Scripture. There's nothing that I could ever learn more about that. That's just not a good spirit to have. You ought to have a... a, a a sensitive and teachable spirit, even when you come to the Word of God on your own, in your devotional time, you ought to be teachable. You ought to yield yourself to God and seek to grow. And we all ought to be trying to grow in our understanding of the Scriptures and especially in our application of doctrine. So this man, a servant of the Lord, he was using his natural talents and he was passionate. He was teachable in his service for the Lord. But the fourth thing that I think we all ought to take away with us this morning about being a servant of the Lord. And this is what Apollos did. We should all desire to exalt Jesus in our service for the Lord. Now, I said that it seemed that part of what he was missing, a key component of what he was missing was some understanding about Jesus Christ. Because that is what is highlighted after this, about what he changed or what he did. After he had received this instruction, now he's going to go and he is going to pass into some other places and he's going to teach and preach. The brothers from Ephesus wrote a letter for him to carry along that he could deliver to other disciples, introducing him. And he was such an eloquent teacher that when he came, he helped them much which had believed through grace. So he found some other believers, some people who had been saved, and he was able to help them. He was able to share with them some things that God had taught him through the scriptures. And specifically what he did in verse 28, he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. The highlight of the ministry of Apollos was that he took the word of God and he made powerful application of the scriptures to demonstrate that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah. Jesus is the one that was promised, and our faith ought to be in Jesus. Immediately, he began to share with others about Jesus Christ. His effort was mighty and convincing because of his natural talents. And his effort was done publicly. No small feat among people who were enemies of Jesus Christ. Bear in mind that persecution was already 
beginning to get very strong. And Apollos would be subjecting himself to that same persecution. And yet he was not ashamed to declare himself as a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, we bring it to this point because I want to emphasize this truth this morning. That when God gives us gifts, when he gives us natural talents or abilities, when he blesses us with things, we should use those in the service of the Lord. We should be passionate about what God has done for us and the message that we've been given to share. We should certainly be teachable to learn perhaps more about that message, perhaps how to better present that message, but we should all be teachable. But all of this is for the reason that we would exalt Jesus Christ. Our service for the Lord. Remember this, Lehigh Valley Baptist Church. Our service for the Lord is not to build a big church. Our service for the Lord is not to get more members here in this congregation. Our service for the Lord is not to promote some kind of a personal kingdom or a personal following for ourselves where others would think highly of us because of our natural abilities and our passion. That is not the goal. The goal is to exalt the name of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the only way of salvation. If people are going to be saved in 2024, it's going to be through the name of Jesus Christ. The gospel has not changed. The same gospel that Apollos preached is the gospel that we preach today. And we ought to do so boldly and passionately. We ought to employ the blessings and talents that God has given us for the purpose of of exclaiming and proclaiming that message, but we ought to do it so that Jesus would be lifted up. If we could have an aspiration as a church for the year 2024, could it be that Jesus Christ would be exalted by this church? That when people come here, they would know that we are all about Jesus. That Jesus is the central focus of our ministry, that Jesus is the one who has saved us, that Jesus is the only way of salvation, that Jesus ought to be worshipped, that Jesus ought to be lifted up. We all should desire as servants of the Lord not to exalt ourselves, but to exalt the precious name of Jesus. Now this morning, I want you to think about yourself. Are you a servant of the Lord? If you've been saved and you know that Jesus is your Savior, then you are a servant of the Lord. So as a servant of the Lord, are you using your natural talents in serving the Lord? Are you passionate in your service for the Lord? Are you teachable in your service for the Lord? And are you exalting Jesus, pointing others to Jesus in your service for the Lord. And if you say no to any of those questions, or partly so, or almost, then may our resolution this morning be more of Jesus in 2024. Let me be a servant of the Lord and serve Him with all of my being.